Have you heard anything divisive lately? About anybody in this room? Have you heard anything divisive lately about, let's just say, this church? About the Main Street Church of Christ? you heard anything divisive lately about us? About anybody in this room? Better question might be, have you said anything divisive lately? Look around at this room. Have you said anything divisive about us, this people, your church family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones who have the same hope and the same faith that you've got? Have we said anything? Have we heard anything divisive lately? If you heard it, what'd you do with it? If you said it, why'd you say it? Those are questions we're going to talk about today. And I want you to leave this building today knowing, I want you to be built up. I, we're going to get there, I promise. But I want you to know that God has some words about people who use words like this, whether we're the ones who hear them or the ones who say them. You probably have seen some of the images that I'm going to show you in the first four or five slides this morning if you've watched any late night TV. Recognize that guy? Billy Mays there. He's got OxyClean, and he wants to sell you some OxyClean. It's not just Billy Mays. There's another guy who sells some towels maybe to clean up. Once you've used your OxyClean, you can use the ShamWow to clean up your OxyClean mess, right? And maybe your, maybe your ShamWow got too dirty or something, so use OxyClean to clean that up. What's my next one, Michael? I forgot the order. After the ShamWow comes, all oh, the Snuggies, yeah, yeah. You get a Snuggie, right? If you're cold and you want to look like that on a couch with your family, you get you a Snuggie, and then you wake up the next morning, you want breakfast, and this one's a new one to me. Oglets, have you seen these, or egglets? Maybe it's, maybe it's egglets, and it's a perfectly cooked egg. <laughs> I'm thinking omelets on the brain, but egglets, perfectly cooked egg. Now, here's the thing. If somebody came to you and, and uh, they said, hey, you want to buy my, my bucket of OxyClean? You'd probably say, no, i got some detergent at home. Or do you want to buy my Snuggie? No, I don't want your Snuggie. Do you want to buy my egglet here? No, I really don't want to buy your egglet either. But wait, what's the, what, how do you finish that? There's more, right? But wait, there's more. You don't want one bucket of OxyClean. You want three for free after you buy the one, right? But wait. There's more. And you don't want one Snuggie. You want a family pack of Snuggies. And so here's what I want you to see. It's not the product that gets you. Because nobody, you're watching this advertisement on TV, and you're probably not going to buy it if they're just offering you one bucket of OxyClean, one ShamWow, one Snuggie, or one Egglet. You're probably not going to buy that. But when they say, but wait, there's more, if you buy right now, you call this toll-free number, you go online right now, you buy this, you're not just going to get one Egglet. You're going to get six for the price of one, right? That's when you make the call. It's not what they show you at first. It's what comes at the end. It's not what they, they start with. It's what comes later. Now, where am I going with this, right? Look back at Proverbs chapter 6. There's a point to this. We can just read Proverbs chapter 6, and we can talk about this, this list of, of things that Solomon, the writer here, writes about in Proverbs chapter 6, and he says in verse 16, there are six things the Lord hates. And there they are, haughty eyes. Uh, maybe a proud look is what your Bible says. Number two in his list is lying tongues. We don't want to be around somebody who's spreading lies or, or talking about falsehoods. Nobody wants to deal with that. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run to evil, breathing out lies. All those list of six things are terrible things, right? And you, before you even read Proverbs 6, you would know that those are things that God does not want us to do. He doesn't want us to be about those things. He doesn't want us to deal with those things. He wants us to be free from that stuff, and God hates those things. We started out this morning, Stan led us in a song to talk about how God is love, and I'm so glad that he did. I didn't even request it, but he did because God is love, right? And just because we read in Proverbs chapter 6 that this God who is love hates these things doesn't mean that he's not a God of love. It does mean that because he's a God of love, these are things that he hates. Because if a God is a God of love and he wants people to love him and he wants people to love his people, one another, then of course he's going to hate these proud looks and he's going to hate lying tongues and he's going to hate hands that shed innocent blood and hearts that devise wicked evil things and feet that run to those evil things and the, the breathing out of lies, of course. A loving God's going to hate things like that. And that's what the writer says. He says there are six things God hates. But wait, there's more. 
Those six things, we would all look at them and say, those are horrible things. We don't want to be about those things. I don't want to be somebody who runs to evil with my feet. I don't want to be somebody that uses my hands to shed innocent blood. Those are horrible, wicked, evil things, right? Of course they are. And God hates those things, but wait, there's more. Back in verse, 12, or verse 16 of Proverbs 6, when he says, there are six things the Lord hates, he's using an ancient Near Eastern literary device to highlight one thing in his list. There are those six things, six things that God hates, but there's a number seven on that list that he wants to highlight in this one. If you don't believe that, you can go back and start at verse 12 where Mark started for us a few minutes ago. and You can talk about this person who in verse 19, the one who sows discord among brothers. There are six things God hates. Seven is the one you want to look at, though. There are six things God hates, but wait, there's more. There's number seven, where Proverbs 6 wants us to focus, and it's on the one who sows discord among the brothers. It's not the first six that are going to get us. It's that seventh one, and that's what Solomon wants to highlight for us. Let me tell you something about sowing. Sowing is scattering out the seed. And if you spill some seed, that's called an accident. And he doesn't say anything about an accident right here because somebody who sows this seed is sowing this seed on purpose. Nobody's accidentally going out there and sowing cotton seed, and they're going to bring up this great cotton crop this year. Nobody accidentally does that. If you're going out and you're going to plant soybeans, if you're going to go out in your garden and plant tomatoes, you're not accidentally sowing seed. That's called spilling seed. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about something that is always done on purpose. And when he highlights in verse 19, the one who sows discord, he's talking about people who deliberately, on purpose, do this. Have you heard anything divisive lately? When you look around this room, have you heard anything about the people that you see, the faces that are looking at you right now? Have you heard anything divisive lately? About the Main Street Church of Christ? Have you said anything divisive lately? Have you spread anything divisive lately? That's what we're talking about today and it's not done out in the open i want to tell you that it's always done on purpose and it's targeted not to the ones who might say whoa whoa whoa, whoa. we don't need to be talking about that do we it's not targeted to those that's spilling a seed sowing a seed is done to the ones who are gonna hey you know that that might be right you know what I, I had no idea about that person i did not know they were like that you're telling oh you're kidding me right sowing a seed is done on purpose and it's done in a fertile place where that seed can take root and it can grow into something that God hates. Six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination. Have you heard anything divisive lately? I think we need to spend some time talking about why these seeds are sown. And I can give you two good reasons. One of them is pride. I might sow a seed of discord among my brothers and sisters if I feel like I'm getting the shaft here, if I feel like I'm kind of being run out, then I might go around and I might stir up some strife if I feel like it's going to help me. And here's the mindset that gets me there. I think I know better than everybody else. I think I know better than what we're doing. And so I need to go find somebody who's going to be receptive to my seeds of discord, and I need to sow that seed deliberately, not out in the open, no to sow it somewhere where it can take root and it can grow because I know what's best. That's pride. Because I deserve what I want. When Jesus lived a life that didn't get what he deserved, I deserve what I want. When Paul writes, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or something to be grasped, but he gave it up and came and lived a life for you and for me, not concerned about his interests, not concerned about what he needed or what he desired, but he was concerned about you, and he was concerned about me, and he was concerned about all of us when he gave up heaven to come down to earth and live as a servant and go to the death of a slave on a cross. He did that, not because it's what he wanted, but it's what was best. And here we are saying, no, I'm going to, I know what's best. I know what I want. I know what I need. And selfishness comes next. It says, I'm going to get it. And if it's not what I want, it's not what I think I need, and it's not what I think's best, I'm going to do whatever I can do 
to sow some seed to get what I want. Have you heard anything divisive lately? Look around. Have you heard anything divisive? Have you said anything divisive lately? If you flip over a few chapters, I want to take you to Proverbs chapter 16, and there are some passages here that I think we need to investigate together. First of all, let's, let's, let's jump over to, to chapter 17, I think. Let's start there. Proverbs chapter 17. Here's how you do it. If you're looking to sow some seeds, not spill it. No, 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 not an accident. This is not accidental at all, okay? This is how it works. If you want to really sow the seed in fertile ground and let it take root and grow into something God hates, here's step by step. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So number one, look, if you want to sow this seed of discord among brothers, you can't just do it once. Nobody just wants to do it one time because then the seed might grow, it might stop. But the one who repeats a matter, not just once, you repeat that matter, you're on a pretty good path to getting that seed planted and growing into something that God despises. Now take a step back, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 28. If you really want to get good at this, you're not just repeating the matter. Proverbs 16, 28, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. And so we're not just repeating the matter over and over. It's a, can you believe it? Did you hear what we're doing? Did you hear what that person said? It's a whisper. Because it's not an open. Because seeds of discord don't grow well out in the open where everybody has an ear and everybody knows and everybody hears what's being said. It's whispered over and over again. He who repeats the matter separates the close friends. The one who whispers repeatedly the matter is the one who sows the strife. If you'll turn over in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, I want to show you that the New Testament has a word for these kinds of people. Have you said anything divisive lately? Have you heard anything divisive lately? If you look in your Bibles at 1 Timothy chapter 5, and really for the sake of time, this is the only one we're going to cover. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 11, 1 Peter 4, verse 15, or other passages. But I'm going to tell you 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. Refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned former faith. Besides that, he says, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also, he says, gossips, busybodies, saying what they should not. Have you heard anything divisive lately? Have you said anything divisive lately? Paul's got a word for that, for these idle people. And if I'm reading 1 Timothy 5 right, who just have nothing better to do than from go to house to house and person to person and whisper repeatedly a matter and divide people against themselves, saying what they should not. And so he says, I'd have younger widows to marry and bear children and manage their households and give the adversary, Satan, no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. Have you heard anything divisive lately? You said anything divisive lately? That's what Paul's talking about. They got nothing better to do than go from person to person and house to house and whisper repeatedly these matters. Paul says they have strayed after Satan. You said anything? It's in your mind? heard anything? How'd you respond? Paul's got a word for it. Solomon says, there are six things the Lord hates, and seven are an abomination to him. Highlight that seventh one, the one who sows discord among brothers. And in 21st century Christianity, we would say the one who sows some strife in brothers and sisters in Christ. Us, that's me and it's you and we're in this together we have the same faith we have the same hope we serve the same Lord we're on the same team 
But even 2,000 years ago, Paul says there are people who are running around from house to house, person to person, straying after Satan, gossiping, being busybodies, sowing strife among the brothers. And I want to tell you, that is what God hates most. It's shocking to me that in this list in Proverbs 6, there are hands that are shedding innocent blood. And Solomon is saying, nope, don't focus on that one. And he says, there are feet that are running to evil things. There's hearts that are devising wicked plans. Those are in the list of six, but wait, there's more. And that's the one you got to focus on, the one who sows discord among the brothers. That's the one that God hates. Let me tell you why God hates that. Because you can read a prayer in John chapter 17 where Jesus is at the end of his life. And do you know what he prayed for? He prayed for unity. Do you know who he prayed for? He prayed for you, and he prayed for me, and he prayed for us. He prayed for the Main Street Church of Christ. He prayed for all the churches so that they would be one as he is one with the Father. Jesus prayed for unity, and the one who sows seeds to divide it is doing the opposite of what Jesus prayed for. They're straying after Satan. That's only one. When Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he writes about how we need to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul, this great apostle who goes about planting churches and, and, and writing letters, he says what we've got to focus on is the unity that we've got in the Spirit of God and the bond of peace that holds us all together. And the ones who go around whispering repeatedly this matter are doing the exact opposite of what Paul wishes we would do. And then there's that verse, that, those two verses in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus says, I've shown you what you need to do. He washed their feet. He became a servant to them. He did not seek his own interest. He sought the interest of others. He loved them. And in John 13, 34 and 35, he says, I've shown you this example. You go love others just like I showed you how to love right here and right now. And somebody who's out there being divisive is not just opposite of what Jesus taught and prayed for, not just opposite of what Paul wishes, it's opposite of this example that Jesus has given us. And so it's bad, right? You heard anything divisive lately? Have you said anything divisive lately? Where are we in this? Before we move on, I want to tell you how we should respond. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 16, I want you to look at just, just a few verses. Let's start in Romans chapter 16. How do, we, how do we avoid this, falling into this trap? How do we avoid straying after Satan, as Paul describes it? I know those are very harsh terms. They're not mine. They're God's, and so let's just talk about them. How do we avoid this? Here's what Paul says, Romans chapter 16. And he says in verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers. Now, your Bible might say Mark, okay? Mine says, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. And he says, to avoid those people. That's pretty clear, right? I got a couple more passages we're going to talk about from Titus and, and uh, another one. But, but here's pretty clear, right? You want to avoid this? You've got to watch out for the people that Paul labels busybodies. Watch out, he says, for those who cause divisions and create obstacles for people in the faith. Have you heard anything divisive lately? You said anything divisive lately? Paul says, for those who are causing divisions, we've got to take note of those people and watch out for the whispers. Watch out. For the one who repeatedly tells a matter. How are you going to avoid that? Watch out for the ones who are sowing these problems. Watch out for the one who sows discord among the brothers and sisters in Christ. Go to Titus chapter 3 with me. Here's another way that we can avoid it. We can reject these divisive people. Flip over to Titus chapter 3, verses 10, I believe, and 11. Here's what he says. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, he says, have nothing more to do with that person, knowing that such, these are God's words, Paul's words, not Chad's words, okay? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. 
watch out for that person, don't have anything to do with that person, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and self-condemned. Have you heard anything divisive lately? Have you said anything divisive lately? How are we going to avoid that? Paul says to Titus, you've got to reject the divisive people. One more, flip back over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. As he rounds out this letter where we read about those who go around house to house, person to person, stowing up uh, or sowing these uh, terrible things. He says in 1 Timothy 6, 20, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Avoid the divisive speech. So there you have it. It's labeled six things God hates, seven are abomination to him. Watch out for number seven. That's the point. The one who sows discord among the brothers. Watch out for that one, okay? In the New Testament, how are we going to do that? We've got to watch out for those people. Same language. Watch out for that one. Avoid that person, he says. They are warped and sinful, he says. And then he says to avoid divisive speech. And so, have you heard anything divisive lately? You said anything divisive lately. I want you to know that God is love, and God loves you, and God loves me, and God loves us at the Main Street Church of Christ. He does. But there are some things that a loving God hates. And number seven on that list, and I think number seven because it's number one, is the one who sows discord among brothers. Here's how you really avoid it. You be more and more and more like Jesus. The one who in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, looked out not for his own interests, but for yours. Was not prideful in that he was the son of God, equal with God, not prideful at all, but gave it up selflessly, coming down here, living this life, had no home, had no pillow to lay his head on, had everybody against him at times, gave it up for you and prayed at the very end that you and me and all of us would be one. Have you heard anything divisive lately? Have you said anything divisive lately? Here's the church. Can you do it with me? Let's do it together not a kid's class this is a sermon but here, here's the church here's the what open it up and you see all the lady was teaching a bible class vacation bible school and she had a visitor in her class and the boy had a handicap and she was a little bit worried at first and, and i don't want to do anything to single him out i don't want to do anything to make him feel unwelcome and make him feel like he's an outsider and so they made it through class okay the boy's handicap was that he did not have a right arm so they made it through class okay, and everything was going great, and she felt good about it. And then they had a little bit of time at the end, and so she said, okay, everybody, get out your churches. And here's this boy who doesn't have a right arm. And the teacher thought, I've blown it. Made it through the whole class and did not make this guy feel singled out at all, didn't put him on the spot, didn't do anything, and here I've blown it at the end. But a little girl was also in the same class, and she was sitting beside the boy, and she said, it's okay. Let's make the church together. And so they put their hands together, and here's the church, and here's the steeple. Open it up. And here are all the people. It's a very good lesson for me. And it's a very good lesson, I believe, for you and for all of us. We're called... To build one another up we're called to encourage one another we're called to be the church that jesus died for we can't do it unless we're building the church up together and i'd be hard pressed to say i'm building the church up together if i've been saying something divisive or if i've been listening to something divisive and if I've let those seeds of discord plant in my life, in my heart, in my mind, and grow up into something, that's what God hates. I still believe that the future of the Main Street Church of Christ is bright. And I believe our future is going to be better than our past. But we've got to do it together. 
Maybe today you're here and you're not yet a Christian, and, and I do want to invite you to become a Christian this morning. I want you to be washed in the blood of Christ. I want you to have your sins washed away. I know that you want to be freed from the guilt of sin, and today if you want to be baptized into Christ, I would love to do that for you. Have you said anything divisive lately? Have you heard anything divisive lately? And if you've heard it, have you followed Paul's instruction to avoid that person, to avoid that kind of speech, to reject those kinds of talks? Have you said those words? Have you been the one who's doing the thing that God hates and sowing the seeds of discord among the brethren? Today, I hope not. But unfortunately, today, I know that sometimes we do. Maybe what you need this morning is to stop. If you're doing that, it's not a maybe. It's a definitely what you need to do is stop. That's what Paul tells us. That's what God tells us because God hates it. It's the opposite of what God wants for us, opposite of what Jesus prayed for, opposite of what he lived and died for. And so number one on your list of things to do has got to be to stop it, to quit. Maybe you've sowed some seeds to the score that have planted and taken up root in the lives of some people, and I think number two on your list in repentance is to go to that person and apologize for doing something God hates, sowing that discord. Maybe from here on, when you hear, have you heard anything divisive lately? When you hear those things, maybe you follow Paul's instruction to stop listening, to put an end to the conversation, to let the person know that that is what God hates for his people to do.